Hello everyone, welcome to round 8 of Grand Prix Louisville here in Kentucky. Rich Hagen sitting alongside Pro Tour San Diego champion from 2007, Mr. Jake Van Lunen. And we are away with Mono Blue on the right from Stephen Neal. And on the left of your screen, um, it is William Huey Jensen, the 2013 member of the Magic Hall of Fame. So Jake, tell us a little bit about this matchup, who's favoured and why. All right, so this is Esper Control against Mono Blue Devotion. Mono Blue Devotion is planning on emptying its hand quickly, putting a lot of stuff onto the table, and then using all of those tools to just overrun its opponent before they have a chance to get any pressure. Okay. Now, now it, we've kind of got the holy trinity right there, haven't we? Uh, yes. We've just seen the Thoughtsies uh, from William Jensen, and he's going to see Nick Thos Shrine to Nix, Biden to Thassa, uh, Master of Waves, and Thassa, God of the sea so it's like all the all the devotion all the time uh, and it's Thassa the blue god uh, that hits the graveyard you know just the think tank effect the ability to scry every turn off of Thassa god of the sea is actually quite strong at grinding out these control decks so mm. Huey's going to be happy to get that out of his opponent's hand Thassa is also indestructible Huey knows that he has a supreme verdict in hand and that he can follow up a master of waves from Stephen Neal with his powerful four mana sorcery. So he's going to want to do that and he just needs to find some white mana to construct that plan and make mm -hmm. it all come together how he wants it to. Do you have a sense of how vulnerable uh, the three color deck is? We're not, we're not used to a standard world where so many players are turning up with 21 islands or 23 swamps or 18 forests and so on. Um, is the Esper deck vulnerable on its mana base? Uh, certainly, and that's a problem that we were seeing a lot in the old standard format when everybody was playing three or four color decks. But now that we're in this new standard format where devotion has become such a deciding factor in what people are going to play, um, you don't really get that same amount of mulliganing, that same amount of uh, lack of color that you get when you have a more diverse uh, standard format. Mm -hmm. Not that it's necessarily not diverse, but... Sure. So here we see the first Master of Waves, and that's gone almost immediately. And of course, all the tokens that would have come with it go away, because they are fundamentally 1-0 elementals, which is a really cool bit of design. Definitely. Back. And William Jensen has access to divination there on his turn, but instead elects to keep open dissipate mana. Mm -hmm. He knows his opponent has Biden of Thassa. Dissolve? Dissolve. I'm sorry, yes. So, presumably there is a white source of mana on the top of Huey's deck right uh -huh. now. Here comes Cloudfin Raptor, quite late in terms of evolving, that one. Uh, and Jensen, one, two, three, will cast Divination and draw two. He drew another Detention Sphere and a Watery Grave. Lays Island passes the turn. Still struggling for mana. So there will be no evolution for the Cloudfin Raptor right now, but the Tidebinder Mage keeps on piling in. Jensen is, of course, not at 20 life. We'll get the uh, scoreboard sorted for you momentarily. As he untaps, and that, and very elegant it is too, is a white mana source. It's that beautiful beta planes yeah. right there. Yeah. So just uh, working out the optimal way to spend this three mana, and finally, Tidebinder Mage gets sent packing. That did a lot of work for but a vanilla 2-2. Two -two. Certainly, and I mean, that's something about this new standard format, where people are going to be forced to one-for-one one each other so much. There's mm -hmm. not that much card advantage to be had. Um, and that's kind of exciting for a format. It is. It's right? very exciting. I mean, you have games that are really close all the time. <laughs> So now just a 0-1. And now a 1-1, one, one, and now a 1-2. <laughs> yes. And here oh. it comes. I love those badges. They give those away. I played a Magic the Gathering Pro Tour Hall of Fame member. If you do that at some GP, you know, they give Paolo a stack of these to give away. He plays them. It's like, 
Yeah, I'm surprised they didn't just print them as I lost to a. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> So in comes the Judge's Familiar and Cloudfin Raptor with that one very large and stylish counter. And now here we're going to see end of turn. It's a big moment for any Esper control deck. It's Sphinx's Revelation. Did not get bad suddenly in new standard shocker. <laughs> Probably the most powerful effect on any card in standard right now. Mm -hmm. Sphinx's Revelation is going to be something that we're going to have to deal with for months to come. And now with all these devotion decks in vogue, we're going to see Supreme Verdict alongside Sphinx's Revelation at least for the coming month or so. I wonder how many people have tapped out for a Sphinx's Revelation today and then been judges familiared out on board. Just gone, Ooh. oh, usual, just tap them all and then... Boom. I'm sure it's happened to someone. Yeah. <laughs> so here's an Azorius Charm um, saying, I would like to send this back to the top of your library. So no prizes for guessing what Stephen Neal will be drawing next turn. Three mana. And finally, after the Thoughtseize right at the start of the game uh, took away the first Tharsa, here's the next one. Jensen draws. It's a scry land, one of the temples. And he puts that straight into play and says, yep, I'll leave that right there. Thank you so much. Another detention sphere, and away goes Tharsa. Now that's a great detention sphere there. He knows that his opponent will get the option to scry next turn if he doesn't get rid of that Tharsa, and he really wants his opponent to draw that 0-1 that doesn't have anything to pump it up. Yeah. And there it is. Jensen up to 10 land now, and he's drawn another Sphinx's Revelation. And so he has his revelations oh, to burn at this point. Yeah, his hand is super stacked. Any conceivable way back uh, here for the mono blue? Um, it seems extremely unlikely to me, unless uh, unless William Huey Jensen is uh, drawing some obscene amount of land and very few cards interact when his opponent is able to draw yeah. a Thassa, which is able to resolve into a Nightfell Spectre. Sure. It doesn't really seem possible for him. Yeah, and he's just drawn point. six cards, gained six life. Utterly savage. And now, one, two, three, four. So this could be the first... It's been, it's been a long old game, and this is going to be our first appearance of uh, Jace, potentially. First Planeswalker, as we see Supreme Verdict wipe the board, and then six mana. Is this going to be a uh, bit of Elspeth Sun's champion action? It is, and I imagine that you're about to see three 1-1 one, one soldier tokens come in. And this is about the point in the game where we could expect um, Steven to concede. Yes, sweep up my permanence. Yeah, Actually, right. Elspeth features in my favorite play of the entire Pro Tour last week, which was Sam Black telling us about how in Limited uh, he had Elspeth in play, bestowed... That must be very nice. Yes, yeah, we'll get this. <laughs> and then bestowed Celestial Archon on his opponent's creature to make it big enough to kill with Elspeth's middle ability. And then he gets and the Archon back. And then he gets his Archon back. That's like, yep. That's I, pretty I, exciting. I would stand and cheer for that. That was uh, yeah. that's pretty awesome. <laughs> that is very awesome. I mean, arguably not as awesome as just having Celestial Arc on an Elspeth Suns champion in your first 3-0 and draft deck. But, you know. <laughs> I feel like I might be somewhat responsible for that because I raincored one of Sam Black's creatures and then killed it with an intrepid hero just weeks earlier <laughs> on Magic Online. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> How much, because you're obviously, you're a columnist on MagicTheGathering.com specifically um, with regard to the Magic Online world. So you're, yes. you're in the virtual world a lot. I to am. To what extent do the, what I might call the Magic Online grinders kind of have this fraternity at real life events where, yeah, you're the guy who pack ratted me in that daily event last Tuesday, aren't you? And, oh. You know, are there lots of sort of Magic Online war stories? Oh, definitely. They're always thrown around. Um, before this event started, Adrian Sullivan walked up to me and said, uh -huh. I, I played against you on Magic Online earlier this week. You always drew your Domri on the right turn. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> and things like See? that. It's, exactly. it's quite fun. Um, Brad Nelson and I originally met through uh, telling battle tales from Magic Online against one another. 
Wow. And okay. that was at Nationals in 2007 before either of us were known entities at all. Sure. And we became close friends very quickly and then yeah, it went from there. Well, I think th the thing is you all understand just how many hours are involved in getting good at Magic Online. Playing Magic Online doesn't require a lot at all. Getting good at Magic Online, that's a task. Really is. It does take a lot of hours, but it rewards you very, very much. I mean, the, the Magic Online players who are doing well in daily events, who are doing well in premier events, they're some of the very best players in the world. And all of my practice for Magic Online, I think that set me up pretty nicely to play my very best against the players of the Pro Tour last weekend. I played mm. very well. I was proud of that. Yeah, it's uh, interesting to see how... Because I'll be honest and say that I have always been curious uh, and m mildly cynical, I think would be fair, uh, to see how Magic Online qualifiers do at the Pro Tour because there is an awful lot of stuff that goes on around the 75 cards that is very different to the world of your lounge, a comfy chair, a cup of tea, a girlfriend partner saying hi on the way past on turn three. That is not what you get in round 13 of a Pro Tour. It is a very, very different beast. Um, and increasingly you see someone like Dmitry Budakov, who won the mocks uh, in Boston earlier this year, he made uh, the top, I think finished ninth, technically, um, at the World Championships. But, you know, he had a very solid performance there. Um, and then Kentaro Yamamoto, who you played against for about four and a half minutes yes. um, in the final of San Diego. <laughs> um, he was a Magic Online qualifier for Dublin and, of course, made it all the way to the top eight with his uh, Mono Black Devotion deck. Um, so it seems to me that increasingly the Magic Online qualifiers for Pro Tours are kind of starting to figure it out. Jake's just quietly dying off to my right. Don't worry about it. He'll be it's okay. fine. I turned the microphone off. <laughs> yeah, but the Magic Online qualifiers, they have to fight through huge fields. They have to play very well. They have to play against some of the very best to get there. And when you're playing in real life, there are certain things that are different. Sometimes you have to remember something like an Obsidat trigger. You have to remember all these small things that you're asked about on Magic Online. But when it really comes down to it, on Magic Online, those really difficult plays are still very difficult, and you're going to be forced to make them. Yeah. So William Huey Jensen is on the left of your screen. He's a newly elected member of the Hall of Fame and very richly deserved one of the finest players the game has seen. And up against him, 1-0 down with what looks like a tough matchup, Stephen Neal. And now we get to see what potentially the Mono Blue deck can do against Desper Control uh, down a game. Let's see, Jake, whether Stephen Neal can pull this match around. It doesn't look like his opening hand is very strong. He only has two two-mana creatures along with five islands, but he's going to be forced to keep that. The Mono Blue Devotion deck does not mulligan mm -hmm. well. Is one of them Frostburn weird? Looks like it might be, at which it point is. potentially you go, oh, okay, here's my 1-4. Next turn, hit you for four. Next turn, hit you for four. Yeah. And, and see how far that can go. Oh, and a very nice draw step there. Mm -hmm. uh, he draws a Night Veil Spectre. Okay, so now he's actually in a position to curve pretty nicely with Tide by Domange on two, Night Veil Spectre on three, and then a ready to pump Frostburn Weird on four if he doesn't have anything else to go at. Meanwhile, though, Huey Jensen has elected to voluntarily punch himself in the face twice in the form of an upright Hallowed Fountain, which tends to suggest, well, there might be a spell coming in uh, Stephen Neal's turn. Let's see. Now, Huey, uh, no hesitation whatsoever allows the Tidebiter Mage to hit him. That's got to be telling <laughs> that he has something like Essence Scatter or Syncopate in hand. Uh-huh. Oh. But no, nothing interesting here. Wow. That yeah, was that was very interesting. Well, I mean, it, it's quite surprising that his opponent ran out the Nightfell Spectre there right into those open lands from Huey. Mm. So now, in comes the team. Four points of damage. Jensen will fall. Ooh, and that's a pretty nice one to get, a Supreme Verdict. <laughs> yeah. And he can't cast it, but he's going to be very happy <laughs> that... More importantly, neither can Willie Jensen. Correct. 
So it's a pretty slow hand for Jensen because he's sitting there. You can see Sphinx's revelations there as he takes up more damage from an upright Hallowed Fountain. One, two, three, four. He did already have a Supreme Verdict in hand, so the board is clear once again. And the game will reset uh, with uh, Jensen uh, at 10. Uh, so here we go. It's Planeswalker time. And that is a Japanese version uh, of Jace coming down. And he's going straight into the mini fact or fiction mode. So we see Judge's Familiar, Tidebinder Mage, and an island. And this is interesting. Uh, Huey definitely cares more about the Judge's Familiar than he does about the Tidebinder Mage. Uh, Steven can cast the Judge's Familiar this turn, and it also shrinks the potential Sphinx's revelations that William mm -hmm. Huey Jensen would have access to. Not a bad turn there from Stephen Neal. Not at all. I mean, as for the start of a new game with Jensen at 10, he's got a Planeswalker down. He's got a little thing in play that stunts a bit of growth. Jensen passes the turn. And as you say, right now, he can't even Sphinx his revelation for one on this turn. Which is certainly relevant here. So the judges familiar will come in. I see a negate uh, in hand for Stephen Neal, and that could be very important, because at some point, Jensen's going to have to pull the trigger on some kind of revelation, and at that point, he's going to find a no on the other side of the table. In that negate, definitely going to be big here. Ooh, and a good-looking plane shift gain save there. Mm, style points. Yeah. Not to mention, yes, that really is happening. No dissolve <laughs> for you. Gain save for me. Here's a Frostburn weird. And Stephen Neal is in decent, decent shape. Jensen is inside single figures. He has a Judge's Familiar on the other side that is causing him a little bit of extra problems in the Sphinx's Revelation department. A Frostburn Weird that can get very big. A Jace Architect of Thought already down, already generated cards uh, for Stephen Neal. Stephen has cards in hand, including the gate. Here's another mini fact or fiction. Gainsay, Tharsa, God of the Sea. Back up Jace. That's pretty nice. <laughs> That's good stuff going yeah, on here. you can't complain about that. So, do you want the, in theory, redundant Planeswalker plus a counterspell? Or do you want the God? The thing is, the god is real and live as soon as Tharsa hits play, because two from the Frostburn Weird, one from the Familiar, double blue from Jace, that's your five, six from Tharsa, it's pretty there nice. to spare. So Huey choosing to take all this damage. And now here's Tharsa. Let's have an argument. I win that argument too says the mono blue player. We've seen two counter spell wars in a game of standard. Yeah. Awesome. It is pretty exciting. Game I says love counter spell like no other reasonable human. <laughs> well, we're, we're yeah, fighting on that yeah, together. He's in a pod there, I believe. In the biggest way. <laughs> so now Jensen with tons of cards, but not tons of time. That board is representing all kinds of fiery death, or watery death, probably. Passes. Little scry action, does not want to back up Tharsa. Draws into an island. This is going to be interesting. If, uh, if Steven decides to cast, ooh, he decides to cast Biden pre-combat, and that's going to be it for Huey. Yeah, Jensen having a look at that. And now, smash with the team. And Jensen still looking and waiting to see whether we're going to see some pump on the Frostburn. <laughs> no, he says, that's, that's it for now. Yep, that looks like well, seven to me. Yeah, the thing is, of course, we know there's a Sphinx's revelation in hand for Jensen which he can theoretically fire off for two. Uh, he's just going to... Okay. Hero's downfall, the Frostburn weird. That's re very rough for Huey, though, because now he goes to one, and yeah. the judge's yes. familiar can just peck him to death. Yeah. You know. 
he has discovered how many licks it takes to get to the center of the Tootsie Pop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is uh, looking extremely grim for the Hall of Famer. We could be well on the way to 1-1. And to be fair, um, it's just been a super reactive game uh, yeah. for, for Jensen where he has tried to do several things and not been allowed to do any of them. Let's see whether he is allowed to Sphinx his revelation for two. Yes, he is. He's back up to three. There's a Doom Blade there. And That's that it. is the end. Good stuff by Stephen Neal, both at six and one. So neither of these will be out with a loss uh, here. The loser will have one more chance to make it into day two. Remember, seven wins or better gets you in. Uh, meanwhile, worth remembering that there is another Grand Prix going on in Hong Kong uh, right now. And if my time zones are roughly accurate, we may be heading towards the start of day two there round about now because we're into the evening here in the US. That means midnight, early morning in Europe, and then add a kind of nine or ten or something like that for Hong Kong. I think they're 12 hours off yeah. where we are here. Exactly. Oh, okay. So, right, okay. So they're probably like just a little way off the start of their uh, day two. Several of our top 25 ranked players have gone there. Shuhei Nakamura is there. Yuya Watanabe was 7-1-1 one and one overnight. Nakamura 8-1. and one. Uh, coming in. Uh, Martin Users also uh, in Hong Kong rather than coming here. He's gone the other way, as it were, from Europe and uh, is uh, down in Hong Kong. Um, Surprising. I normally find that traveling east gives me more jet lag. Yeah. Yeah, but... Yeah, on my way here, I stopped in a local game store at Manchester and ran, in, ran into a Pro Tour competitor, Nick Wong, from Hong Kong. And he had list, he was, like, flying home to the GP from Heathrow and had just, like, stopped across to, you know, just hang out and play some magic and stuff. And I was like, yep, That's okay, awesome. good luck in Hong Kong. We'll start yeah. in Manchester. And you go to Hong Kong, I'll, I'll go to Louisville. Um, yeah, he had a fun weekend in Dublin. It was a great Pro Tour. Really was. It really was. It was... It, Beautiful experience. I think Couldn't have been happier. Yeah, and I think it's worth saying a, a very special thank you, and not just because I'm local to there, uh, but a massive thank you to the Irish Magic community. They really pushed the boat out. They were super friendly. So many great people I got a chance to meet um, over the week. And the number of players who came up to PDM, myself, and just said, I've had a great Pro Tour. I died on day one. It didn't matter. I've never cared less about not doing well on a Pro <laughs> Tour because there were so many great people to see and so many great things to do. I'm sure we'll be back to Dublin, whether it's another PT or perhaps a European Grand Prix because we, we could certainly do that. Um, and that would be very very fun to go back so thanks very much beautiful venue too oh it's yeah just gorgeous former sort of masonic palace as it were in uh, yes, the royal uh, dublin the, society yeah the statues as you walk in on either side it, yeah it, it felt like you had some semblance of importance when you walked yeah. into that room the kind of place that that royalty would be name checked on the door to make sure they got in yes. yeah it was a lovely venue to make sure they're part of the society yeah <laughs> in, indeed <laughs> So we're gearing up for game three here in round eight between William Jensen and Stephen Neal. As you can see, it's Mono Blue Devotion on the right of your screen, Esper Control uh, on the left. Um, and Jake, I don't know how much chance you've had to look at Ashiok uh, in action uh, so far today, but that is a card that has really grabbed my attention as a fantastically designed, incredibly complex card that seems to be powerful without being automatically busted. It just seems to be in a fantastic place. Ashiak is one of my favorite cards from the new set. I had the great honor of getting to write the preview column. Oh, that was Ashiok. yours. And there, by the way, is an Ashiok in William Jensen's hand for this game three. So we might actually get to see him in action right here, right now. Now, I was... Uh really impressed with the card when I wrote the preview column. A lot uh -huh. of people disagreed with me when I thought the card was very strong early on, but they're coming around. Yeah, <laughs> And yes. quickly. Yeah. Tidebinder Mage. It does actually have quite a lot of text on Tidebinder Mage, but it turns out a lot of the time it's a traveling philosopher in blue or something similar. And here we are. Ashiok Nightmare Weaver. Five is the standard opening gets plus two loyalty and the top three cards get exiled and it's huge in matchups like this because you're allowed to play the creatures that get exiled with Ashiok and it's worth noting that in a matchup like this you might even ultimate Ashiok 
and exile all the cards from a hand and graveyard, and it turns out that those were exiled with Ashiok, you can play those with the middle ability as well. It's very exciting. Yeah. Even here, we're going to see uh, William have the opportunity to uh, minus two this Ashiok, putting it down to one counter, mm -hmm. to put that Tidebinder Mage into play. And that's going to be huge, because his opponent won't have any spot removal left in the deck, and that essentially blanks his opponent's Tidebinder Mage, and yeah. then yeah. allow. I mean, his opponent will have to spend mana with the Thassa to continue attacking the Ashiok. Ah, it continues going upstairs. Back to five. So that was a Bident of Thassa, a Mutable, which is potentially relevant at some point, and an island, and we will see a temple. How important are the Scrylands to the Esper deck? Extremely important. They help smooth out your mana. They're very good at making sure that you hit key land drops, like your fifth or sixth land drop when you need to. Mm -hmm. They're also very important for finding cards, like a Supreme Verdict, for example, where that card might have been, you know, one in 15 cards in your deck before you had the Scrylands, and now it almost feels like it's one in 13 or so. Mm. I'm also very interested on a sort of slightly deeper strategic level at when people are playing their Scrylands. Because they come into play tapped, you would naturally think, oh, that's my turn one play. And an awful lot of people are playing an island on turn one. And then their temple, and they're holding off until they have a better idea of what they're looking for. Yeah, I mean, especially when you're playing control deck like Esper, you don't necessarily want to lead with those Scrylands unless you have a key play coming up on a mm. significant turn. So here's a Nykthos Shrine to Nyx, a very exciting land coming out of Theros, because now Judge's Familiar is up, Tide by Domange is up, Tharsa God of the Sea, all there, so Nykthos is going to start generating some mana, and what is Stephen Neal going to do with it? Let's see. He's got four cards in hand. And that, you can just about see it there at the bottom of your screen, that is a Jace Architect of Thought. And what will he do with that? I think, uh, I imagine, he at least, that he's going to minus it right away. Okay. In a matchup like this. Yep. And I believe that that is, again, say, a Frostburn Weird and a card that is super blowout potential one day, Cyclonic Rift. Yes. Wow. Cyclonic Rift can be huge here, especially with the Ashiok at five. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so although Jensen got underway with a pretty exciting turn three, here's Ashiok, let's get him going. Uh, Steven's already developing a really nice board. He's got a Planeswalker of his own. He's about to either get a hard counter with Gainsay or two very nice spells. Getting a Frostburn Weird as the bonus on top of your Cyclonic Rift seems pretty awesome. And that, that is seems very good. Yeah, that's what he's done. So a straightforward Jace turned into two cards, and relevant cards at that. So, in comes the team, and Tharsa's going to go at Ashok, because of course Tharsa is now thoroughly devoted up. Uh, thanks to the double from Jace. Five comfortably there. And we're back with Jensen. And he goes into scry mode. We had a hero's downfall in hand. That's interesting. Surprised he didn't use that more aggressively on that Tidebinder Mage. Here's Supreme Verdict. And that explains why he did not. Yep. Unfortunately, it's, it's odd because you really need to be aggressive with your removal spells against this blue deck. It, it just snowballs so easily. Right, uh-huh. Scry away uh, in the upkeep. That's Tharsa's ability. Have a look. See what you want to do. Six cards in hand now for the mono blue player, Stephen Neal. And just a fistful of gas here for Stephen Neal. He's going to be able to um, activate Nykthos, Shrine to Nyx, producing three blue mana. Mm -hmm. Breaking even in terms of amount of mana produced, however, giving him the triple blue that is necessary for his Nightfall Spectre. Uh, okay, I was going to say, because that just seems like a three for three, why do you care? And answer is, there it is. Night Vale Spectre. And now Mutavolt becomes live. And Tharsa's back live again and piling in and Jensen in trouble once more. It's like that Supreme Verdict never happened. Here's Jace again. They're just uh, confirming live totals by the looks of things. Pass the turn. 
So was that a plus on Jace? I guess it must have been. Uh, it must have been. He's looking yeah, to I mean, use it again next turn. Yeah. And uh, William does have access to Hero's Demise here, but he might be uh, forced to use that as a play that goes in conjunction with... Oh, okay. Wow, okay. So while you're tapped out, I really want to draw three cards and gain a little bit of life back and dig for answers. But now there is this... Well... <laughs> Just this huge possible turn. I really like that play a lot from William Jensen mm -hmm. here. Uh, he gets an opportunity to cast a Sphinx's Revelation while his opponent is tapped out when he knows that his opponent has gain saves. Mm -hmm. He puts himself out of range from dying to his opponent's attack the next turn, and he guarantees himself or significantly improves his chances of having a seventh land to play untapped on the following turn, which will give him access to Supreme Verdict, which he can then couple with Hero's Demise to keep his opponent off attacking him with Thassa uh -huh. as a, as a follow-up to the Supreme Verdict. Pretty nice for Huey there. So, here is Jace, and Jace says, well, there's a Mutavolt, an Island, or another old-school gainsay. Now, the thing that Huey's thinking about is he... Of course, the obvious split is Gainsay and two lands, but the Mutavolt is extremely relevant here. It actually messes up the math for Huey on his Sphinx's Revelation into Supreme Verdict play. Right. So, if Huey is can somehow trick his opponent into not taking the Mutavolt, then he can win. But hmm. so he can win. It's possible. Interesting. Still. Yeah. His opponent, again, does not know what cards Huey has in hand, so his opponent can't possibly conceive and construct the, uh, the expected outcome of mm -hmm. the following turn. So here's Nykthos, and this time it's not a 3 for 3, it's an infinity for 3 <laughs> trade. No, not quite that many, but there's a lot. And now here comes the team smashing in. Let's take a look at what goes away from Night Vale Spectre. It's a detention sphere. A pretty nice one, one that Huey would yeah. have been very happy to have drawn. And as you see on your screen, Jensen is down to two. He has drawn Elspeth Sun's Champion, which ha does have the advantage of not being able to be gainsayed, but I'm not at all sure that's going to help him right now. Yeah, now, unfortunately for Huey here, because he drew the... Uh, uh, because he was unable to draw a yep. land that came into play untapped, he was unable to construct the Supreme Verdict Heroes to play that he so badly wanted to do. And... There we see Stephen Neal able to steal a game from a very difficult matchup. Huey being, you know, a little bit conservative with those removal spells and just getting run over by Nightfall Spectres. Interesting. There was an awful lot of land coming into play si sideways for Definitely. William Jensen in that match. It just felt like almost every turn he was no, no, no mana on turn one. One mana on turn two, four mana on turn five, six mana on turn seven. A just relentless parade of, of tap lands as we head across uh, to our other match, uh, which, as you can see, is in progress and has a very, very different complexion uh, on the board, as you can see. Both a Stormbreath Dragon and a Pelucranos World Eater on the left-hand side of your screen. And a ironically lonely Desecration Demon on the right-hand side of your screen. So we see Daniel Ramos on the right playing Jund. Pretty interesting choice here. Uh, facing off against Osip Levadovich, uh, the uh, Pro Tour Venice champion. Indeed, 2003. 2003. And that Stormbreath Dragon has just functionally chumped the Desecration Demon by tapping it down. Yes. That's why you see the one counter on the demon. Uh, and the life totals here, we're almost at the end. Lebedavitz down at four. Daniel Ramos up at nine. Both players at six and one here. And in comes Polukronos from Osip on the left. And we're going to see a couple of creatures uh, eaten out of the graveyard. For some life gain for Daniel Ramos, he goes back up to 11. Osip does have creatures in hand. So yeah. has the opportunity to keep that Desecration Demon 
offer. This is this is going to be a tight one because the Desecration yeah, Demon can get tight. repeatedly blanked. Yeah, now uh, this Scavenging Ooze can grow this turn by removing the other Scavenging Ooze, and this Sylvan Carry added will allow the Scavenging Ooze to grow even further while continuing to lock down the Demon mm. that's on Daniel's side of the table. This is game three, and this is for the match. Yeah, and remember that the winner here is into day two at seven and one with one round to go. Round about a thousand players at this event, so you're looking at ideally eight and one um, overnight. I mean, obviously everyone wants nine and zero, oh, but realistically, once you're in eight and one, puts you in very good shape for the day two run towards the top eight. Six rounds tomorrow, then your top eight. Osip will eliminate from the graveyard in order to put a counter on Scavenging Ooze and gain life. He untaps. That Desecration Demon is huge, but doing not very much right now. Five plays 11. Osip can uh, make the Scavenging Ooze into a 4-4. Um, if he has an untapped land in hand, then he can attack with the Scavenging Ooze and the Polukranos, which will give him exactly 11 damage. But that's only if he has an untapped land in hand. And then the big question becomes, what does Daniel Ramos have in hand with his six untapped land and two cards as he sits there with his hands on his hips waiting to find what the 2003 Pro Tour Venice champion has in store? So one off from being able to kill his opponent with what's on the board, but definitely relevant what he has in his hand. He could, for example, have something like a Gore Clan Rampager, which could change the math entirely. Looks like Daniel has uh, picked up his pen. Hmm. But Daniel Which could mean almost anything. Yeah, Daniel probably has a removal spell. He's leaning back. He has uh, you know, hand in his lap. It, it seems like this is... Uh, this is either a situation where Daniel has nothing or he has something, and I know that sounds no, brutally but simple. But no, but I know I know what you mean by that. Yeah. And uh, it's going to be here we go. Let's see what Osip does as he looks to tap a temple and a forest. One, two, yeah. and we're going to see some uh, Gore Clan Rampager pump action. I mean, he just puts his card down and says, does that make you dead? Yes, yes it, it does, does make you dead. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I am dead. In the binary game of something or nothing, <laughs> it was nothing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Um, all right, so Osip Levadovitz goes to 7-1. and one.